the numbers continue to be abysmal about the low representation of women on boards. And this panel um, was, was inspired by a few things. Um, one, I, as I told these guys, uh, well, I was taking a plane trip down, I think it was to Florida last winter to catch up with my family for a weekend when they were on vacation. And I sat down next to a very nice gentleman. You know, what were you, were you traveling to or from? Oh, I'm retired in Florida. I'm just up for some board meetings. And I was like, oh, I've seen this so many times. I'm like, yep, that's how you're paying for that house and boat in Florida because yeah. he's, you know, was a very nice man, was uh, the president of a very small bank in Rhode Island. And then he got into that network. And now now, you know, earns, um, makes quite a living on being on those corporate boards. He's a, he mentioned that he was about to, his position was ending up, and I said, so is the next person who's replacing you going to be like you? And he said, no, we're actually trying to make someone be more like you. And I said, that's great, because we need to see more of that. But again, I know it's been the mission um, um, of the folks here. But in thinking about that, I've seen that time and time again. And I watched with, um, uh, so impressed when the treasurer took office and um, made it such a priority, not only using her bully pulpit to promote this issue because she lived it in her, you know, in her business career before becoming our treasurer. Um, to, you know, knew the value of getting these different perspectives. But then she's used some leverage, you know, as, as running the, the pension board, the prim board here in Massachusetts to use proxy voting and other things. And she's continued on this path and, you know, more recently developed a piece last year to not only just lecture at companies about what's good for them, but also help connect the dots for them, giving them this is how you do it, this is what you need to do to change the culture in your firm per first and then contribute that. So we wanted to talk about that. Following what the treasurer was doing, I was so excited when I saw what State Street did in, you know, taking this, this idea and applying it on this huge scale and doing it in a way that got a lot of attention. And so I'm so thrilled to have Tracy Atkinson here from State Street to talk about that. So here it's, it's like, okay, we all know it's good for companies. Here's some good ways to use some leverage and give them the skill sets to trying to do this. And then what an amazing um, group of talented women here. Every single one of you should be on a board now or sometime in the future. So let's go out and do that. So, but you need the confidence and I know, um, I know it's hard for all of us and it's just, you know, it's kind of a women issue sometimes to not feel like, you know, confident enough to go in. But hopefully with some of the skills Abigail was teaching us earlier, we can get out there. And Jenna spends her life now, she's worked with, you know, human management and, and helping people skill sets with uh, placing executives and has, and has taken on a mission uh, to try to help get more diversity on boards. And so here we have this amazing resource to help us. What skills should you be, be developing? What network should you be, um, you know, locking into to do that? So I'm really excited about this, as you can tell. And um, <laughs> so, no. and, and without, I don't want, you know, there's, there, each of our speakers, their bios are in, in the, um, in the program. So I'm not going to take more time of me talking because I want to let them. And I'd, I'd love to start with you, um, Treasurer Goldberg, and thank you for being here. Well, Megan, thank you for having me, and I'm glad to look around the room and see all the exciting women that are here today. I really um, am particularly touched because so often when we're in the public finance setting, we don't see enough women in the room. And in fact, beyond, we're here to talk really about corporate boards today, but for me it's far more holistic. Uh, when I ran for treasurer, what was incredibly exciting about it is the Mass Treasurer's Office is so, has so many diverse functions that we could use the leverage all across the Treasurer's Office beyond the pension fund, candidly, to enhance um, the career paths for women and women in fields that have not been typically, um, where they have not been represented. And that, of course, is legal, finance, state government, you name it. Uh, yes, the year I was elected four years ago, a number of women um, did win, but candidly, when you're talking about um, women in politics, you are also talking about women in boardrooms, you're talking about women at law firms, you're talking at women at uh, private equity, you're talking about women at venture capital, it's all the same thing. 
Uh, I didn't stand a chance of not being an advocate. I was very fortunate. I was mentored from the time I was born because my mom, Carol Goldberg, who ultimately was president and chief operating officer of Stop and Shop when it was over a billion dollar company, was one of the top 10 business women in America in the 1970s. So between her mentoring me and Evelyn Murphy mentoring me, I have absolutely no choice than but to be doing what I'm doing. So when I ran for treasurer, it was, um, you know, of course it's about um, financial transactions and making sure that we take care of the taxpayers and that we well manage the treasurer's office. That's a given. But it was also for me about diversity in terms of women and people of color. It was about wage equality and we audited the tre every division in the treasurer's office as soon as we got in there for wage gaps for women and people of color. And we also, in our hiring from day one, made sure that there was a diverse pool, and you know what? There was, because there's plenty of qualified women out there and plenty of people of color who are qualified and the treasurer's office, you need to have a skill set. This is not a legislative function. This is not a policy shop. This is an area of state government where the treasurer in many ways is a CEO of a very diverse corporation. When you have alcohol regulation, the lottery, and the pension fund in one division, you have a diverse corporation. But it also gave me the opportunity to use the leverage of the treasurer's office, and we did immediately. Um, three out of five of my deputy treasurers are women. My general counsel's office, which has nine, uh, 10 attorneys and one paralegal, is nine women, one man, and the paralegal is a man. That just gives you a sense of the environment. And by the way, it's intentional diversity, but the most qualified people for the job get the job. My chief of staff is a male. My first deputy is a male. So this is not, um, this is not reverse discrimination. It's that when you build it, they will come. And so um, I knew from my days at Stop and Shop that you could have a socially progressive um, attitude about so many things you do and still be the number one business and we were in New England. We were the first to have um, diversity. We were the first to uh, have, we brought in the unions ourselves. We gave 100% health insurance, and yet we were number one, because we know that when you do the right thing, you also do well. And so that's why I was so delighted once I arrived that organizations like State Street, like Pew, like McKinsey had the data to reinforce what I intuitively knew. And we stepped into the pension fund and I looked at the proxy voting guidelines and it said we will not vote for a company if there isn't at least one woman or one person of color on the board. And I looked at everybody and went, one and done? <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. So, Megan, you remember those days. And so, um, immediately, I wanted to go to 30%. Uh, and we saw that at that time, we had about nine to 10,000 companies we invested in. And it looked like we wouldn't be voting for anybody. So I decided to create aspiration. And I put in 25%, um, if, you, if you didn't have 25% women and people of color, we didn't vote for you. Well, it worked. And then uh, Kelly Rogers is here today from the treasurer's office in Rhode Island. Kelly, where are you? Please put your hand up. So Seth Magazine, our treasurer of uh, Rhode Island, calls me, says, Deb, I'm going to beat you out, and I'm going to put in 30%. <laughs> and I went, well, I'm doing it in February. I was just trying to create aspiration. You have to mentor and nurture people, Seth. So immediately we uh, did that, too. But I'm going to tell you something else that we did. We coupled that with an overboarding guideline, oh. because it's great if you have these standards of 30%, but what if there are no openings? And the overboarding guideline, again, was fundamentally based on 
business operations. You know, again, Carol Goldberg was one of the only women in the country on these corporate boards. And until last June, and she's 87 years old, she still was on her last public board. But I said to her, hey, Ma, what about these guys? You know, some of them, six or seven of, you know, they're on six or seven boards. And of course, you know, they're making a couple hundred thousand a year doing this. Can they really function appropriately in today's world for these companies? And she said, absolutely not more than three and you're spreading yourself thin with the issues that companies have to deal with today. So again, I wanted to create aspirations, so we began with five that we would not vote for companies that had board directors who were on more than five. And let's think about the board directors. Hey, we're out in a foursome playing golf, I'm, I'm retiring from my company, Joe, what do I do? Oh, I'm gonna recommend you to my board. That is the vetting that often takes place for men. And, um, and we talk about the imposter syndrome, and I don't know if you want to talk about that during the questions and answers, because I have stories about that. But um, what overboarding does, and when companies begin to um, comply with your request, and we started with five, we gave them, we were trying to give them a heads up because we immediately dropped down to four the year before. This is the mom in me. The mom in me gives you a warning and then, then comes in strong, and by the way, with the 30% and the four, there's still more to come, guys, so make sure you know that. Uh, and so, uh, it, but it creates the openings and forces the issue. So Megan mentioned our um, toolkit. What we did is we convened um, three areas of business in the Boston area that uh, really are where it's at in terms of good paying jobs, boards, um, a lot of high profile for people, and it was healthcare, financial services, and the high tech world. And we brought in people from companies um, that were both diverse and were women, and, and how you get it done in your industry. And our report, which is available on our website, um, explains what successful companies have done, how they've gotten it done, the approaches they take, how they outreach to find women and people of color, and results are there. Companies are more creative, more innovative and more profitable when they have a diverse workforce and a diverse board. But why the boards are so important is that it starts at the top. And business decisions are made in those boardrooms. And if you only have one voice, you're not reflecting the world. And candidly, the rest of the world is doing it better than we are. And I do want to give a shout out to the California legislature because this past week, they made it mandatory, just the way Great Britain has. But until the rest of the world in, that, in the United States catches on, We've got to figure out ways to empower all of you and use all the resources that we have to push the envelope the way we are doing it here in my office and the way we're hoping other businesses are catching on to. With that, I don't want to dominate the conversation, so Megan, give me the elbow and let's hear from who's next. No, no elbow needed. I could hear you all day long. I oh, thank you, Tracy. Great. Well, I can keep on going, but Marty Walsh might not be happy. I know he's showing up no, at 11. I think it's great. I just you know, totally echo everything that you've said, Deb, and I think um, you know, much of what State Street's doing is directly aligned with what you're doing and your leadership. Um, you know, I think it's really important. It is this call to action. It is, um, you know, starting to um, require things to happen, whether it's through uh, corporate governance uh, actions that we can take, through legislative actions, as well as forcing companies to be more transparent with what they're doing. Um, really, we need to start moving the dial. And for years and years, we've been talking about mentorship, and sponsorship, uh, but now we really need to start talking about what the numbers are and what the n outcomes are and really starting holding people accountable. 
And I think in order to do that, we really need to make sure that we're attacking this on both ends, right? So we have the one end around companies and making sure that they're uh, being transparent, that they're setting targets and goals and that they're reporting on their success of those things. And that they're also making changes to some of their hiring practices and their HR policies and procedures to enable them to achieve those goals. And then there's the other end, it's us. And what are we doing to make sure that we're positioning ourselves to be viable and credible candidates, not only for board roles, but for continued advancement and leadership roles, which is really the ticket in order to, to get us into the boardroom. I'm more than happy to share my thoughts on that latter part. Uh, in my own experiences being a, uh, a director on Raytheon Corporation for the last five years, and it's been really an outstanding experience and, uh, and something that I value very much. Um, but I have been asked to talk about State Street's approach, um, both what we're doing internally as an organization and what we're doing to try to influence that in other public companies. Uh, many of you might be familiar with uh, giving your roles in public finance with State Street, but for those of you who aren't, uh, we are based here in Boston. Uh, we are a global financial services company servicing institutional uh, asset managers, uh, pension funds, public and private, central banks, insurers, et cetera. Um, we provide a full range of services, including uh, record keeping, custody, uh, research, uh, data and analytics, and asset management. Uh, we uh, safeguard and administer 34 trillion in assets under administration, so we have quite a voice in the public markets. Um, and uh, through our uh, State Street Global Advisors, which is our asset management arm, is really where we can exercise that uh, corporate governance uh, most specifically, and that is uh, we're as one of the world's leading uh, asset managers and money managers. As part of our responsibility as being a financial services organization, we obviously have responsibilities to our shareholders and to our clients to really promote long-term value creation. And when we manage assets on behalf of our clients, we really look to finding opportunities where we can you know, have maximized the probability of having attractive long-term financial success. And we believe firmly believe that diversity in leadership and in the boardroom is, is primary predicate in order to have that long-term focus. The research, is, as Deb has talked about, is pretty clear on this. The companies that have diverse leadership have improved financial performance, and they also have a lot less of the corporate governance issues that we see in the paper every day with frauds, with bribery, with uh, disruption uh, in the leadership ranks that result in um, uh, shareholder lawsuits and shareholder concerns. That's why we've been, you know, internally trying to advance it in our own company, and it's also why we've been, uh, have a call to action to public companies on which we invest on behalf of our clients. And it is also uh, the impetus behind our Fearless Girl campaign. Uh, last year on International Women's Day, uh, State Street Global Advisors called on uh, all of our companies to increase gender diversity on their boards. And so for every company that th didn't have a, a female in their boardroom, we told them that we would use our proxy vote to vote against them. This, we drew attention to this by uh, uh, commissioning a statue called the Fearless Girl, which we placed in the epicenter of the financial world in New York City. Uh, the statue was really meant to, uh, to demonstrate the power of women's leadership and to symbolize that and the importance of women's roles in the boardroom and in leadership. Uh, I have to say that we, we didn't anticipate what the reaction to that was going to be. It was really amazing. Um, within hours after uh, placing her in the dark of night <laughs> in New York City, uh, it, was so, it went viral on social media. Twelve hours later, there were a billion tweets <laughs> about the fearless girl and crowds lining up in front of her to take their picture or their selfie with her, and that's still happening today. Um, we're very proud uh, about the Fearless Girl and what that's done to inspire this kind of next generation of female leadership and to reinforce our message about, um, about board diversity. Um, and so I thought, um, if we could, there's a brief video that I wanted to share with you about the Fearless Girl. Exactly one year ago, a girl and an investment firm stood up for what is right and what is true, that businesses with women in leadership perform better. We began by creating a symbol that no one could ignore. Then, we called on 700 companies who didn't have a single woman on their board to take action. 152 added a woman director, and 34 more have pledged to do so. 
There is still much to be done, because there's a lot at stake. For every girl growing up, every woman who's faced that invisible no, every investor seeking a future that's better, but already a generation can see that progress is possible when we stand fearless. So as you heard in the video, after the first year, we had over 150 of those companies that we called upon who agreed to commit to adding a woman to their board. And just June, we updated our statistics, State Street Global Advisors updated the statistics, and it's now 300 of those companies. And like there, we're not stopping there. Yeah. So we've extended what our guidance is uh, to the companies that we're investing in and asking them to, uh, to uh, be transparent and to report on where they are around diversity metrics in their own leadership teams. Um, you know, as we know, and, and there's nobody who knows that more in this room than what gets measured gets done. And having those targets and being transparent in them is what is gonna do the thing to increase uh, diversity in the boardroom and in, in the leadership broadly. We also need to make sure that we're addressing gender biases in the workplace and culture and HR uh, related practices within organizations. And so I'd say at State Street, you know, we're very proud uh, of what we're doing to promote diversity, but we're not perfect. And we have a lot to do. And we are doing some things. In 2011 was when the first time that we started actually creating goals and targets. Um, we start reporting on those, we measure and hold our managers accountable for that and we're transparent with our employees about where we are in those goals. We review them every year and every three years we reset and we get more aggressive every year. Uh, we've also done a lot around the HR practices because you can't ask people to uh, improve where we are on the metrics without enabling them and supporting them in doing that. So we've done a number of different things. Um, one is that we've um, started to mandate an, uh, a diverse slate for whenever we have uh, new positions or candidates in. Um, we require a diverse slate uh, for all of our senior roles in particular. Um, we've embedded a diversity focus in all of our talent management practices, so that includes succession planning and promotion processes. And we've implemented diversity awareness and unconscious bias training throughout our entire organization. We've also enhanced parental leave policies for both men and women. But we still have a long way to go, uh, and we're holding ourselves accountable to that. And we're not gonna give up uh, what we're doing here at State Street, and we're certainly not gonna give up on what we're doing to try to influence uh, the companies that we invest in. Well, I want to thank both of my colleagues here at the table for the work that they have done and the foundation. I, I want a fearless girl emoji, okay? I, I want to carry it and, and I hope it rests inside of each of you because uh, I think having that symbol of success and so many women that I work with, when I call and I say, I have this board opportunity, what do you think? And many will say, oh, I'm not ready for that. Because they will immediately go through and say, well, I haven't had experience in this area or haven't done that. Uh, why, Jenna, would you think I would be qualified? And I'm thinking, I don't have that same conversation with the other gender, okay? I don't get that. I get, absolutely, I am the best. What do I need to do? Where do I send that? So, you know, for me, a lot of it is to give you the confidence to say, yes, I can. Yes, I'm ready. Be realistic. Know that getting on boards can be a marathon. It's not a sprint. It takes time, and I hope, Megan, that when you met your uh, passenger friend on, on the plane, that you gave him your business card and said, I'd be a great replacement someday. Because again, it's that networking, and it's that being bold that I wanna make sure that you leave here with today, because that's what's important. The foundation is there. We're seeing the year of the women. When I was at WIC Kiefer, 75% of my board placements uh, were women. And I mean, that was astounding. 
I'm now with Spencer Stewart, and I pulled the numbers yesterday. Spencer Stewart has placed 2,000 women on boards. Last year, 43% of all placements were women, and we're seeing more and more of those calls coming in saying we're looking for women. The other good news is 78% want the financial background. So when I look around this room, I think, wow, you're already there in that you've got that skill set. And so what are the things that you need to do to be able to continue to branch out. And so one of my questions is, how many of you currently today are serving on a for-profit uh, publicly traded board? How many of you are serving on a not-for-profit board? Excellent. How many of you have a current board bio? We have some work to do, don't you think? Mm hmm So number one, board bio. Make sure that you create that. And what does that look like? That is your value proposition. Why would a board want you at their table? What is it that you bring? So things to think about are being able to even branch out of your own experience. So anything that you're doing in strategic planning, any organizations that you've been a part of that have transformed, uh, the experiences are so important beyond your core skills. So raising your hand and taking on something outside your own domain is important. That's going to help you in terms of being able to separate yourself from others and you can bring that experience to the table. It's also important too that when you think about that board bio that again you're you're thinking about how do you differentiate yourself. So part of it is again peer relationships in terms of whether you write thought leadership pieces things where you are known uh, for a particular area, anything like that is important to make sure that you are capitalizing on. Ask yourself why you want to be on a board. I mean, it may be to help you in your current role, it may be for a future role, or it may be to build your board portfolio so that, again, uh, as you look at those potential retirement years, that you have a way to stay connected. Uh, being able to look at educational programs, you know, look at the, the program at Harvard, uh, the program at Northwestern, those where you can invest and be able to, again, understand how to speak speak the board language. Tracy, I'm sure that's something that was really key going in. I mean, when you walk into your first board assignment, it can be very intimidating. And the one thing that I love about having more than, than one uh, female on the, at the table is the fact that I don't want my only female to be a goat, okay? So we're not about having goat herders. We're about being able to come to the table, have the experience, the confidence, the know-how, and to be collegial, because that is important, but also to be able to bring true value. Because it's through that value that more and more boards will continue to diversify. Uh, you'll start to see a very different complexion in the boardroom, which is only going to enhance their bottom line. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Megan. Thank you. Um, I wanted, Tracy, I wanted to ask you, I was looking at the audience when we talked about like for uh, corporate boards and so I saw whether you raised your hand. I hope you did. I did. Um, Tracy is on the Raytheon board and could you talk a little bit about what your path was to the board and how's it going? I hope you're not the only woman in the room for them, yeah. but I'm afraid. I'm not the only woman. Um, first, let me tell you about the Raytheon board. So um, when I did join the board of Raytheon five years ago, um, I, it wasn't, a, you know, take you to golf and get the board. It was a, an aggressive uh, board interview uh, process and you know, a number of different candidates. Um, when I joined the board, there was one other woman on the board. She'd been on the board for quite a while, 10 years. She was the only woman for 10 years. 
um, she left shortly after she had made to herself that she was going to commit to 10 years, and she felt that that was enough for herself. Um, so I, you know, I, but thankfully I was only one meeting when I was by myself because uh, our board uh, quickly uh, replaced her um, with another diverse candidate, and then we've continued to do that. Um, our board has gone through um, refreshment, um, significant refreshment, mostly because we've had a number of long-standing board members who, because of age limits, are now aging off of the board. Uh, in the last year, we've added uh, three new members. I'm happy to say they're all women. Uh, and uh, a big part of that was our uh, head of our governance, our governance committee, our nomination and governance committee, was 100% committed to making sure that we had women uh, as a criteria, a female as criteria on our board selection process. Um, and we actually fired, we hired a firm, we told them we wanted you know, women, and we got you know, kind of a smattering of women, but um, it wasn't um, a thoughtful um, presentation of women and the talent that was available. Um, and then we uh, found a firm who gave us all women all women for uh, policy roles that we were, you know, coming out of the defense industry, uh, all women for the financial role, and all women for CEO type roles that we were filling. Um, today, we're five women on the board. Uh, we're, we're a little uh, larger in size um, than normal because of this refreshment and wanting to make sure that there was uh, talent available and that we got them and we didn't wait, have to wait until one of our uh, board members retired. Um, but when, uh, when we finish this out, we'll probably be 50% women on our board. And this is the defense and aerospace business, right? Missiles, <laughs> um, engineering, um, and, and you know, I came from financial services and I'm on this board and I, you know, part of my dialogue with them uh, when I was asked about this, I, I am a financial expert, I am the financial expert on the board as I suspect many of you that would be your principal. Um, role that you could uh, help boards with, um, having been a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers um, and then been in a number of different uh, finance roles. Um, when I went there and was talking to them, I was bringing to them where I thought we had similarities, being a large global company. Um, and what I've seen in our boardroom and in the boardrooms that I've interacted with where it's about talent, where it's about innovation, where it's about the values of your firm, where it's about being customer focused. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. These are topics that are relevant to every single industry. And so showing that you can bring that a different perspective but on critical topics I think adds significant value. Uh, in terms of being in the boardroom, I remember my first meeting in the boardroom and I'll tell you this um, story, I tell it to women that I work with. Uh, in the board when I first went we've had Five Star General, he was a uh, vice chair of uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Bush's former NSA director, um, uh, you know, former chairman uh, of EMC, uh, so, you know, like uh, admiral uh, of the entire fleet, of the entire U.S. fleet in the room, you know, when they were directing 9-11 response. So um, leadership like you wouldn't believe in this room. Um, and at, first of all, i just tell you, the talent that's in our military is amazing. Um, and so you should feel good about that. Um, uh, and, you know, I was sitting in this room, it was my first meeting, and we were talking about um, extending some technology that we had um, and, and bringing it into the uh, commercial sector. And you know, the, the dialogue was around, you know, what's our government clients going to think about us bringing this technology into the commercial sector? And I was thinking, I mean, this was during this whole thing of you know, Facebook and cyber and privacy, and you know, we were being accused of wiretapping the um, German chancellor and all these things. And I was like, geez, I was sitting back and I finally raised my hand. I'm like, maybe you've already discussed this, but I'm looking at it the other way around. And what is, does the commercial customer want to buy from us because of our government, you know, our huge government backing? And the director, the former head of the NSA, excellent question. <laughs> and I remember coming home telling my husband, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but I, you know, I would say to you that I have, in my experience has been, it's the same experience in the boardroom that got me to where I am in the role I am now. I speak up. And I voice my mind, and if I have a question, I ask it, and I weigh in wherever there's, you know, whatever the topic is. If I'm in the room, I'm there for a reason. And unless, if you don't want me to speak, then you better not have me in the room. <laughs> and so, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, and I found that that is the role that I play on the board too, and it's a different perspective, and it's not being afraid to voice your opinion, 
and, uh, and the respect and the collegiality that can exist in a boardroom that has diverse members in there, understanding that people have different strengths that they're bringing to this discussion can be just so incredibly powerful, and I see it happen there every day. So, um, uh, you know, I'd highly encourage you to kind of think about yourself and what you do every day and how what you do translates into so many different things that boards could value. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Deb, do you mind sharing your perspective? Because the you know, same thing on helping people get over that imposter syndrome. Because so, I think you're not lacking in confidence either. <laughs> well, actually, I'd love to share a story. Uh, when I was 44 years old, uh, I ran for select man, select man in the town of Brookline. And I won. And because um, Catherine Craven voted for me, right, Catherine? <laughs> 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 and uh, I got up the next morning to go get sworn in, and all of a sudden I went, <gasps> and I called my dad because my dad had been in town politics going back, and I said, Daddy, <laughs> do I know how to do this job? <laughs> and he said, to, now I had a Harvard MBA, a law degree from Boston College, I had worked in the business world for years, and I literally said, Daddy, do I know how to do this job? His answer was, there's a lot dumber people who've done it before <laughs> you. Uh, and then I walked in to my first meeting and uh, took off from there. <laughs> but I need, uh, what I want to share is some very important pieces that we've put into place in the treasurer's office. And I want to remind people, we have 800 employees, so it's not a small organization. But mentoring has been a critical piece to it. Carol Goldberg, my mom, at some point mentored every successful businesswoman in this state and outside of this state. I was on a panel in Washington, D.C. where I talked about this and a woman from Virginia walked up to me and said, I flew to Boston to sit down and talk to Carol Goldberg. Uh, we have always felt that mentoring, helping build those kind of feelings of being more self-confident, knowing that you belong there. She had a poster in her office that um, was a kitty cat hanging by its claws from the limb of a tree. And it's about hanging in there and grim perseverance, <laughs> grim persistence. No, candidly, I grew up in that environment. And even so, you heard what I said when I was 44 years old. When I decided to run for state treasurer, it was the year I turned 60 years old. And I had to contemplate this, whereas all these guys were out there running around like, I'm running for treasurer, I'm running for treasurer. Women have to be asked more than five times. You get a kid in high school who isn't sure he wants to go to college, there's an open state rep seat, and I am not exaggerating. He'll go, oh, maybe I'll do that instead. <laughs> a woman would never think that way. Um, no matter where you come down on Hillary Clinton, I spoke to her after she was appointed Secretary of State, and she said to me, I was at an event with her, and she said, I have so much studying to do before I become Secretary of State. Does anyone think that the men say that to themselves? So um, we know at the Treasurer's Office, so we've actually created a fellowship for women in finance. And what we do, it's become quite competitive. It is a summer program. We pay a stipend. But the mentoring part is a huge piece of it. We pair up all the young women across, whether it's Mass School Building Authority, whether it's the financial part of the lottery, whether it's over at the pension fund. And we had three women at the pension fund this year. We have skills that you acquire, we expose you to other financial services in the, in the city, and we also mentor. <coughs> and they hear about that kitty cat hanging from the, <laughs> from the limb. And I do my best to empower every young woman and in the science fields. We've done it da all the way down to the sixth grade level, because you get to seventh and eighth grade, and you try to join the robotics club, and you walk in, and they're all guys there. And some of your girlfriends are saying, why aren't you going to the hip hop club? And this is where it begins. And so we feel that that's equally as important. 
Um, our human resources um, department has been focused on this since before I was sworn in. The mentoring piece, having a broad array of people who are applying for the job, and men, as I said, selecting the most qualified. Uh, what I said to the pension fund board right after I arrived, I walked into my first meeting before I was sworn in. There were 65 people in the room, three women in gray suits, and all the rest men. I almost died. <laughs> and so I told, and the guys there told me, we really try to find women. <laughs> Swear to God. <laughs> what I said is, I think you need me to help you. <laughs> I said, I graduated BC Law School in 1983 and Harvard Business School in 1985. We did have a quota at Harvard, 24% women. And, but BC, we were 50% women. Trust me, over those years of compounding, the number of graduates at just those two schools, there are a lot of qualified women out there. They just need to know that they are going to get paid the same, that they are going to advance at the same rate, and that they are going to be welcome. What that result has been is we have the most diversified um, staff in state government. We are by a long shot ahead of everyone else. We're at 33 to 34% today in terms of diversity, but we are 55% women. And that is because, as I said before, you build it, they will come. People apply for jobs in my office. They know it's the real deal. They know we did an audit. They know we equalized pay. And we instituted, which is unheard of in government, 12 weeks paid parental leave for biological, foster, and adoption. So this is the place to come to. Think about applying to us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Now I'd like to open it up for questions um, for the panelists. And we have some mics again. A few minutes for this. Okay, got one over here. Over on this side. so motivated from what you guys have said. <laughs> I want to get on board right now. <laughs> um, and that's my question. How do we get on a board right now? Well, do you have your board bio? So we'll start with that. Um, certainly, too, you heard a lot up here about different ways to make the connect. So obviously, working with uh, recruiters is important, so that is one way. And we were not the firm that Tracy used that did not produce the, the right sure. candidates, right? <laughs> so, um, but no, you really do need to make sure that you're networking, you let people know that you have an interest on serving on a board, and as many of you have already done, not-for-profit boards are an excellent entree to start. Uh, I had a individual who called me and she was actually a dean of a medical school and she said, I need to get on boards, so what do I need to do? And I said, well, talk about what you're serving on now from a not-for-profit perspective. So we made some changes. I actually helped her get on one that was pretty visible. Um, and she actually did not take the audit chair because so often when you come out of finance, you know, you either take audit or comp. She actually took the business development uh, side and strategic planning for that particular board. That was a real key for her her. Uh, she's now on two for-profit boards uh, and, and is doing extremely well. So it's a matter of start with one, even if it's a not-for-profit, network with recruiters, network with your boss, network through women that you meet at this conference, through others, 
and make sure it's on your LinkedIn, et cetera. I mean, those are all important that you're willing to look at board opportunities and make sure that your value proposition is really compelling. So again, all of those in play. And, and I will add, you do need to be patient because it does take some time. And as Tracy talked about, it's very, very competitive. So just know that if the first one doesn't work out, well, then there's an even better one waiting for you down the road. And I, I'll just uh, reinforce, I think, what you said, uh, Jenna, during your op opening remarks. It's raising your profile mm -hmm. so that people are aware of you, right? And so a bar part of that is, is having a good LinkedIn because they're going to look, you know, if they're looking for different criteria when search firms are looking or boards are recruiting. Um, what are you doing? Are you doing public speaking? Are you on the panels? Are you interacting? Are you writing white papers? Are you doing things to increase your external presence and profile so that these organizations can find you? Okay. Another question? Yes. Uh, Carmen Vargas with Ramirez and Company. Uh, this question is probably for Tracy. You know, someone who kind of asks the questions, okay, well, in a quarter, my company's gonna ask me, what are my outside business activities? And then I kind of sit there and I'm like, all right, I don't want them to know that I'm doing too much nonprofit work, <laughs> you know, because how much time are you spending on work? And I guess the question is, how do you balance that when you're, when you're seeking mm -hmm. opportunities on corporate boards? How do you balance the fact that you, me, for example, I wanna continue in my current position and sort of rise within the ranks of the current firm, but at the same time, I do want to branch out and seek opportunities outside. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for the question. I'd say, first of all, I'm very grateful to State Street, to our CEO, uh, for allowing me the opportunity to serve on a public company board while I'm you know, still uh, full-time employed uh, actively at State Street. So um, when I, uh, my board service is, it is really on my, on my time. You know, I mean, I, uh, obviously the, you know, the firm lets me go when I need to go to board meetings and I'm not charging vacation or something like that. But, you know, board prep, et cetera, or being available for calls or going over for a meeting. I am the audit committee chair. So I have a lot of time, it takes a lot. And it's a lot of time invested in that. Um, and, uh, and so I do that, you know, that's my time, my own time. And I, for me, it's an investment in me and I find it incredibly intellectually stimulating. So it is, it is how I would choose to spend my free time, actually. Um, you know, I, to me, it's, a, it's always been a balance. You know, everything, the demands of your career, your family, you know, um, and it's never like this. You know, I always tell people it's never. It's always. <laughs> and, uh, but women know how to do that. Yeah, they do. And You're multitasking. Yeah, yeah, and you gotta pick and choose. You know, I often tell women when I'm coaching women or, um, you know, what is this doing for you? You've done that already. You've done it for five years. Is really doing it for another five years going to be going to do anything else for you? Is there something else that still aligns with what your mission and purpose that's something meaningful to you, but that gives you another set of experiences or a different group of people that you can interact with or something that's going to continue to broaden? So it is staying fresh with the things that you're doing and asking yourself if, you know, you've learned and you've given what you wanted to do and then what's next because you, you can't you can't do them all um, and you won't do them well um, so it's better to be selective uh, got one up here Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, here, just, just to make sure Elizabeth, what, uh, <laughs> I don't know Elizabeth can speak <laughs> <laughs> um, so so um, picking up on something the treasurer said but this may also be something that um, the rest of the panel can speak to so we're reading a lot about um, companies and large companies uh, talking about wage parity, uh, that they're looking inside, that they're making sure these things are happening. But also I've been reading stories that they really don't know what they don't know. They think they're doing this great job, and then if they really look into it, they find out there's a lot more disparity than they ever thought. And so my question to you is, uh, what do you think the status of that is, and what do you think um, large companies and organizations in general are doing to combat that? Um, this is exactly, when I first uh, was running, I started, I said wage equality from day one. And uh, there is an answer to that question. 
you must hire an outside auditing firm and do an internal audit. Steve Grossman, who was there before me, is a terrific guy. Believe me, in his marriage, Barbara runs the show, and he'll be the first to tell you. He thought he was doing this, and I said to him, did you do an internal audit? He had not. And so that is the first thing that companies need to do. And so when you heard a lot of talk about wage equality at the State House, I said, I take a different view. I am a business person. And so I'm not taking a stick and hitting companies. I believe in companies. I believe in capitalism. And I said, so we created a downloadable toolkit for businesses. And what we did is we helped them understand how the problem negatively impacts their bottom line and how do you get to the root of the issue. And we did focus on them having the right policies and the right people in HR. Simultaneously, we created wage negotiation workshops, which Marty Walsh has done here in the city of Boston, but we have now taken statewide and we're the pilot with our hashtag Just Ask program that will then go nationally. Because we feel the only way to break down these cultural barriers is to give people all the tools that they need to get this job done. So we attack it from all the different areas because no, there are plenty of well-meaning companies and well-meaning people. Prim did think they were doing everything they could do. Well, once I created the toolkit, they downloaded it and used it. As have, we've had hits not only from everywhere in the country, you can go to equalpayma, don't forget ma, dot com and see all that. Plus, I am now um, incoming senior VP of the National Association of State Treasurers. There are 37 Republicans and only less than 10. I know it doesn't add to 50, I am a numbers person, <laughs> but not every state has a treasurer, um, and mainly Republicans. I have been able to present to them over and over with members of my staff why these are economic imperatives. Uh, Ty, people who sell 401ks and are in the retirement business. Let's talk about the wage gap with respect to women. Do they have any money to invest in your plans if they are paying off loans, trying to take care of their families? No, we're trying to create customers for them. So we have to start right at the beginning. And that is how we have approached it from my office. Uh, this is a business imperative. It's good for the economy. It's good for our world and it's good for women and their families. So um, that, that's really the answer. You have to come to it from all angles and you have to make it, businesses don't like government taking a stick and hitting at them. I felt I wanted to take it from the business side and be supportive, just like the 25% to the 30%. We need to mentor companies too so that they can do the right thing. Thanks. Okay, another question. Thank you. More agile than I am. Oh, thank you. You're thank you good. so much. I don't know. You've gone up and down those. Yeah. See? You're an imposter in terms of this. You are agile. Guilty. Very good. Very good. I'm Fearless Catherine. woman. I'm Catherine McClary, Washtenaw County Treasurer, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, we don't have an elected treasurer for the state of Michigan. So. But we're looking forward to shortly engaging the new Michigan treasurer in mass. I, <laughs> and I would help you with that process. Um, first, I have two things, a, com a comment afterwards, but first I want to thank you. This has been an invigorating panel and you probably are deserve another round of applause. Oh. <laughs> I have served as treasurer for a number of years. I, I come to the women in public finance meetings. I served on the board, and I want to thank all of you for putting together such a wonderful conference. As treasurer, I clearly have the financial and business acumen to serve on a board, but having run campaigns and been an elected official for many, many years, worked in state government, federal government, as well as local, 
I've also got those political connections and I have written my bio and I am looking to serve on a board. So what I heard from you today is raising your external profile and networking. So I'm just going on record for any of you. <laughs> that have connections with a publicly traded company. I'm interested in serving on the board and I do have some ideas of where I, which types of companies I would be a better fit and which not. So thank you. <laughs> Great. So I am sure that to get to where you are, you had to run various campaigns in your lives and you were probably uh, dragged through the mud through some of them. <laughs> How do you overcome that and keep your family sane during the process? Is that a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> have you two ever been dragged through the mud? I, <laughs> no, I have. I haven't really been dragged, I, I have. have to say. So. <laughs> um, that's probably the hardest part. Uh, and yet, what kept me motivated was the end game that achieving this role would help me help everyone else. I am sincerely and honestly mission driven. I am a true public servant and I think that comes across. What people have said to me is what they feel at the end of the day has helped me win so many people over is authenticity. My mission, my passion is right here on my sleeve. But at the same time, when people personally attack me, I have to admit, it hurts. Uh, I've gotten more used to it, but you never get completely used to it. And forget my husband, he can't stand it. So um, it's hard. And particularly when you're, and, and this happens in the business world too. I will tell you that when I, I didn't have this personality, but I had the beginnings of it when I was at Harvard Business School. Some guy put a note in my mailbox, who do you think you are? Oh. Because at Harvard Business School, you get um, graded on class participation. So I'm a strategic thinker. If I'm getting graded on this, they're gonna have trouble shutting me up. <laughs> well, the guys weren't used to that because most of the women, candidly, in, in my class in 1984 and 85, had engineering and accounting backgrounds. So they didn't speak. I did, as you can tell. And so consequently, um, and that note in my box hurt me. But Rose Beth Cantor said, persevere, which is what I've been hearing my whole life, and don't you change a bit. Mm. And so that's the kind of encouragement that we need to give each other. And we need, that is why we need to support each other. It's why organizations need more than one woman, because you need to be there for each other. And don't look at the other women as your competition. When I first came on the Board of Selectmen, there was another woman. She felt threatened by me. She had been the queen bee. I decided to defer to her expertise and make her feel comfortable. We have to play a little bit different game, but at the end of the day, we, end, we were best friends. And so one of the things that we know is women and people of color need cohorts in their environments. The comfort level grows. And so it is our job to make sure more women, more people of color are in our organizations and that we support each other. Thank you very much. And I think that's a great um, point to end on, just like Abigail emphasized collaboration as her, the third, like of her stool. Um, but I want to thank the panelists. That was, this is excellent. And um, we will move on with the program. But thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Thank, thank you. you. And now I get to do another fun thing. Um, I am honored to introduce the mayor of Boston, the Honorable Martin J. Walsh. 
and we appreciate uh, his coming and joining us. I know he cut a, a, a trip to D.C. short, um, I think down for the Conference of Mayors, and um, although I'm, I'm sorry to cut your trip short, but there's kind of some bad juju down there right now, so maybe it's not so bad to come back here. So, but we're really thrilled to have you join us, and you must know, I want, want you to be aware that you're actually the only man that's been invited to uh, uh, come and speak to us, and I think that actually is a strong recognition that you are one of the good guys. So, and for the rest of you who aren't familiar with our great mayor, empowering women is a demonstrated priority for this mayor. He's elevated Boston's Office of Women's in Advancement and empowered it to be a national policy leader in forging pathways to equity and wages and leadership. I know the treasurer uh, mentioned one of those programs. The mayor has appointed high-ranking officials in his administration. Uh, the mayor has worked with private employers to close the gender pay gap. He established paid parental leave for city of Boston employees. He created the Women's Entrepreneurship Boston program. And he's also reached out to his constituents and he's provided free salary negotiation workshops for working women in Boston, training over 4,400 women to advocate for themselves. And he's made Boston a leader in ending human trafficking. So please join me in welcoming Mayor Walsh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. And, and um, Megan talked about Washington. The other night I'm watching TV and I'm watching, uh, I don't know, I was watching something. And then I was, CNN was on, and which I'm addicted to. And um, I saw Mitch McConnell on TV and he, he's talking to the, the Senate um, president at the time with the acting, whatever it is. And I was screaming at the TV. And, and I'm like, why isn't there a Democrat in that chamber at that particular moment to, 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 to call out parliamentary procedure or something? Because he was laying down the foundation for uh, the vote that's happening today and the vote that's going to be uh, clearly happening probably tomorrow. Um, and I just got so frustrated. Uh, I got so frustrated. And, and there was, I never really thought about wanting to be a United States Senator, but at that moment on my couch, I wanted to be one, um, honestly, to, to, to let people have it. But um, <laughs> thank, thank you to all, all the women here in public finance. Thank you for, for being here. Welcome to Boston. Uh, we want to welcome you, and, and I hope you uh, have an incredible conversation and conference. Uh, the panel that was just here, um, the treasurer is amazing, uh, Deb Goldberg. Um, she was a she probably told you her story, slight woman. I met her back in 1997 when she was a slight woman. Everything she's talking about today, she was talking about back in 1997 when I was a brand new elected official. And, and uh, really is amazing uh, to have her in the leadership role that she's in. Uh, and the other panelists, thank you. Uh, I'm proud that you chose this city this year for this conference. Um, all over the country, uh, your women are driving powerful change. Uh, you're empowering women to advance their careers and play bigger roles in, in leaders in the industry. Uh, this work has a ripple effect. Megan talked about my work on human trafficking. I ran for mayor in 2013. And uh, we called, we, we had uh, many different policy areas that we were working on, and one of them was around human trafficking and not to, to, to really treat the women as victims in this case and not as criminals. And we called the press conference and we had a whole policy paper written on it. Um, and when we had the press conference, not one reporter showed up. Um, and it was really discouraging because at that point it told me a lot. This was 2013. It told me a lot of how, how the, the, the media, not blaming the media for it, but people weren't paying attention. Uh, people weren't paying attention to, to the issue of human trafficking. And, and you know, and, and I was on a panel the other day in, Washington, in, in, in South Carolina for the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and, and every city has something going on with human trafficking. Um, in, in a way to, to, to really um, identify in, in the women as victims in, in this horrible, horrible uh, area. Uh, so something that we're seeing that change happen. Uh, so I want to th I want to thank you for, for what you're doing because you are it is making a ripple effect. Um, it's important not just changing the culture in government offices in, in financial offices, but it's helping us change society as a whole. Um, when I became the mayor in 2013, 14, um, my Office of Women's Advancement was called the Women's Commission. 
It was led by uh, Megan Costello, who was my campaign manager. Um, and she really didn't want the office, I don't think, because uh, it was an office that was a commission. Um, and I said to her, go down there and change it. Make it, make it an office. And, and one of the first changes is we took change it from a commission to an actual office uh, in City Hall. Um, and we started to really work on a bunch of things, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but what I was doing, I was tired of hearing about legislation. I think I was, a, I was a state rep for 16 years, and I think I voted on five bills that were equal pay for equal work. Um, and, and I said that we have to, you know, it's important to talk, and it's important of the dialogue. But I'm like, the dialogue and talk has to stop. We have to have action, and we have to do things. And this is this is back in 2014, uh, and we started to, we went to work. And uh, Boston has been a leader. So uh, what we're looking at is we, we certainly, in, in, in the world and in Boston and Massachusetts and the country, we need more women in guiding our budgets and capital investments. And I'm going to talk about my chief financial officer. I think she's here, Emma Handy. I don't know if she's here, but uh, I'll talk about her in a second. Where are you, Emma? Thank you, Emma. Uh, but uh, before I talk about Emma, I want to talk about another young woman that I met. 1997, I got elected to the State House, and uh, the Speaker of the House at the time was Tom Finneran, and he had this amazing person in his office that literally had budgets in her hand, and you could talk to her about any line item about budgets, and she understood it, it was Catherine Craven. And I want to thank Catherine, who's here today, who's working over at Babson. And Catherine, li Catherine literally ran, um, even though she didn't have the title, and she, and I don't think she was, she, everyone knew, she ran the state budget for many, many, many years. And you could call Catherine, and you'd say to her, Catherine, my, I have a, you know, I'm looking at a line item, and she would rattle off the numbers and tell you exactly the impacts it would have and how it would affect other parts of the budget, and, and she, she ran that process, and, and it was so important. Um, and, and at City Hall, uh, our chief financial officer is Emma Handy, who's in the back, and uh, she's here today as a member of the Boston Host Committee. Uh, and last year, uh, I was honored to appoint her as the city's top financial role. In her first year, she has led um, even, uh, even, even the city to even a healthy a financial um, situation, achieving a triple-A triple A bond rating uh, for the fifth consecutive year in a row, continuing those investments that we're making in our city that are targeted investments in, in opioid and in, in addiction and in, 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 in policing and in human services and in all the different areas. Um, her, her leadership is an indicator of Boston's culture we've established in the city of Boston. Uh, I'm proud to say that we've hired uh, more women in leadership positions than ever before in City Hall. Um, and, and it's not just about the numbers, it's about amplifying women's voices. Um, it's about celebrating women's success. It's about making sure that we get the diversity of perspectives at the table every time we make an important decision and the folks that are surrounding me are, are oftentimes women that, that, that are the ones I re are the people I rely on the most. The person I put in charge of my Office of Recovery Services, which is the first in the country, um, is a woman by the name of Jen Tracy. Uh, she worked at the state and I brought her into me. Uh, we're building more housing in Boston than any other period of the history of housing in, in, in our city almost. Um, and Sheila Dillon is the head of housing, uh, a public health commission, and Monica Valdez Lupe, and I go on and on and on. My chief of policy, Joyce Lenahan, who was uh, with me from the very beginning when I started to run for mayor, again, guiding our policy and guiding what we do in the city of Boston and the important roles that we take up here and how we, how we push forward. Um, and it's certainly about giving credit to where credit's due as, as we continue to work in the city. Um, as a man, there are many experiences that women have that I'll never know firsthand. Uh, that's why I really rely on, uh, on the people in my administration, the women in my administration across all industries and across our neighborhood to tell me their stories. It's my job to listen and understand and lead the city in the direction that empowers women, truly empowers women. This is especially important to me in our work that's working to close the, uh, the, 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 the um, gender wage gap. Women make up the majority of the population in the city of Boston, uh, but they're underrepresented and underpaid in our workforce. Uh, this is an issue of fairness, quality of life, and justice. When I got elected in 2014, I wanted to understand the scope of this problem, and I wanted to tackle the issue head on. Uh, and I also have a background in labor. I'm, I'm a la union laborer by, by trade. And when you work on a job site, if you're a union member, you get paid the same. So to me, it's baffling that you work in, the, in, in different industries and there's a big discrepancy. But along with the Boston Women's Workforce Council and Boston University, we issued a historic report that shows exactly how bad this issue is. 
It was the first in the nation to use, re use real wage data, self-reported by businesses in the greater Boston area. It represents 11% of the greater Boston workforce and $11 billion in earning. It shows a 23% wage gap for women in Boston, and that number is even greater when you talk about people of color, and as, as the treasurer spoke about that. None of this comes as a surprise to anyone in this room, certainly, but the data allowed us to make sure that everyone in Boston understood how deep the problem was. And we called the Boston, Boston's employers, we talked to them to do something about it. And so far, over 200 businesses have signed up to our 100% talent compact where they give us information and they give us their data, we keep their name off it, and we're able to do true assessments of exactly what that data means. I'm also, I also talk about this issue wherever I go, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce or state or, or state of the city or however it is because we can't just talk about it we also have to make sure that we're letting people know that we're paying attention to what's happening or what's not happening in the industry the businesses have committed to report wage data anonymously and to adapt best practices to retain and promote women. The numbers of the compact sign has continued to climb, so we have 200 employees right now. We're not done there. And other cities are starting to ask us how we did it and how do we get these, these employees to the table. And some of our biggest employers in the city of Boston have signed up. I ask any of you who work in the Boston, our Boston area organization to ask your employer to join the compact if they already have it. And it's really important and if they want no more information or you want more information, you can contact our, our office in the city of Boston. I also want to make sure that a lot of people are aware of the work that we're doing with employees. We offer free salary negotiation workshops all year round all over the city of Boston. So far, we've empowered 7,000 women to, to, get, to, to ask for higher pay and, and to, to advocate for, on their behalf to get more money. The results are inspiring. We found that 90% of those women who, immediate, who took the immediate action following the workshop, they're using their skills and getting raises they deserve. And I was actually in an elevator uh, at one, some event in town, and um, a woman walked on and, and she was very excited. She goes, oh man, nice to see you. And she goes, I, went to, I did a salary negotiation workshop. I'm like, oh, it's great, how'd it work out? She goes, well, I got a job, and, and, and I sat down with the boss and I pushed back, and by the time I walked out of the office, I got $17,000 more. And I thought to myself, I was proud of that. I was proud of that because that was simply a conversation. It was simply a conversation and learning how to advocate on behalf of yourself. And a lot of us, any of us, don't really know how to advocate, but men don't have to advocate sometimes. They sit, they laugh, they talk, and all of a sudden they go on one salary and they come out with another salary without, e without even opening their mouth. So it is important that we continue to do that. This is the hard work, uh, and, but nothing happens overnight. Uh, but the change is happening. Uh, we're, ch we're chipping away at the culture that systematically undervalues women's work. This is the work that all of you have been doing every day of your careers. And those of you that haven't done it, talk to some of the people that have been in the career for a long time and get an understanding of, of what they went through and, and, and the challenges that, that people have experienced. I'm proud to, God bless you. I'm proud, to, I'm proud to stand alongside you as an ally and to do my part to build a better world for women. The gender gap in the workplace, discrimination and sexual harassment are all systemic problems. They will only, they'll only be a thing of the past when men, as well as women, acknowledge them. Men need to be held accountable. Underpaying, <laughs> underpaying women, taking credit for women's work, outright abuse, all of these things come down to power. It comes down to cowards who are so afraid of losing their power that they, 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 keep it, they keep each other people down, silencing incredible women who dare to shine. It's something that I won't stand for and it's something that we shouldn't stand for. That's why I'm so serious about the work that we do in the city of Boston. And that's why, I've joined hundred, that's why I joined hundreds of women the other day and survivors and allies on Boston City Hall Plaza. Those of you that don't know what happened, on Monday we had the Forbes 30 Under 30 conference in the city of Boston. Unbeknownst to me, one of the panelist speakers was Senator Flake. He was in Boston on Monday, and in a very short period of time, within a 12-hour period of time, NARAL and other organizations came together and, and put a rally together on Boston Common, Boston City Hall Plaza. We were there to make it clear that women deserve to be heard and women deserve to be believed. We were there to make it clear that sexual assault was unacceptable, 
no matter how powerful the perpetrator or, or hide the office. If there are any survivors here today, I believe you. It's up to our entire community to support you. It's up to all of us as a society to, to, to confront these issues. It's up to men to do everything they can to do everything they can to fix the problems that are going on inside today. Whether you work for government or nonprofits or private finance, all of you are in touch with the things that are important to our communities. Many of you have broken new ground as women in this industry. All of you have a role in moving us forward together towards equal representation, whether it's in Boston or another city. And I just want to thank you all for being here today. In Boston, we're never going to let up on this work, not until every woman gets paid fairly in every single industry in the city. And we're going to take it just beyond the city borders in the greater Boston area and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We're going to set, we're going to set a priority and we're going to set an example on how we do it in our city. We're not going to give up until sexual harassment and sexual assaults are taken seriously and investigated properly. Not until we see just as many women and men working in public financing, leading institutions, or serving on the Supreme Court. Every day, every day we get closer to where we need to be. Even when it feels like two steps forward, one step backwards, we're doing the work that will get us there. I want to thank you all for being a part of that. I want to thank you for being a part of this great organization. I want to wish you best of luck in the rest of this conference, and I hope that you enjoy your time in the city. Go Red Sox. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, um, and actually, uh, I have a little gift for you. I want to give you this pins because you're now an honorary member of Women thank in Public you. Finance. Thank so you. thanks again. Thank you. You're welcome. So, all right. And now I want to invite up to the stage the president of our organization, um, Monica Suarez. Thank you so much. It's been an inspiring morning and we're looking to continue the program after lunch with uh, more enlightened discussion and, and great topics this afternoon. This year marks the end of my three-year term as a national board member and it has truly been an honor to serve as president of the board this year. I want to take a moment to highlight some of our achievements for the year. Alabama became our 18th chapter, 1-8. It's amazing to see that growth. We've added 125 new members, bringing our total to 750 members. <laughs> We've added two new board committees to enhance opportunities for our members, education and communication. Communication, the communication committee will be improving communications to chapters and members, sharing information about local chapter events, and enhancing our social media presence on LinkedIn. Uh, many of you are familiar with our LinkedIn group, um, but we will be more actively using the Women in Public Finance company profile, which doesn't have that many followers as of right now. So if you have your phone out um, and during lunch, I encourage you to log in to LinkedIn, find the Women in Public Finance company profile, not the group, and, and follow it. We're going to be using that to share more information, share uh, chapter events. In July, the Education Committee hosted our first national program, a webinar with gutsy leadership titled Own Your, Own Your Authority as a Thought Leader with Influence. In July, we also launched the first phase of our mentorship program, a pilot program that our mentorship chair, Lourdes Abedin, will tell you more about during lunch. This year, the board really challenged ourselves to move forward on the implementation of the strategic plan that laid out the goals for the expansion of, of the organization and enhanced membership benefits. These achievements and growth would not have been possible without the hard work and dedication of the entire national board. I would like to take a moment to recognize the members of the national board and ask them each to stand and, and please hold your applause till the end. Uh, Vice President Megan Burke, 
hold the applause, Secretary Karen Daly, Treasurer Joanna Brody, Assistant Treasurer and Chapter Liaison Samantha Funk, Lourdes Abedin, Stephanie Ferry, Ginger Flahaven, Kathy Garner, Kristen Hansen, Marge Henning, Susan Kendall, Robin Redford, Julie Santa Maria, Carolyn Schmidt, Marina Scott, Ann Spano, and Jennifer Wright. Thank you so much for your hard work. <laughs> We are seeking letters of interest for next year's new class of board members. Uh, the, the board is made up of 18 members and it is a three-year term and uh, six members roll off the board each year. Uh, more information on how to apply can be found on the national website. That's www.wpfc.com and letter of, letters of interest are due by October 25th. We will also be opening up participation for the 10 national board committees to all women in public finance members. Historically, those committees have only been uh, staffed or uh, the participation has been limited to board members, but we will be opening those up to all women in public finance members. Uh, more information on that will be distributed before the end of the year. We had our annual in-person chapters meeting yesterday, and it was fantastic to see the enthusiasm of our local chapters and their leadership. Uh, we've talked a lot about expansion and local chapters, events, and programs. Next year, we will be planning for two in-person chapter meetings to provide additional opportunities to share ideas and get feedback for our national level programs. I would like for all of you who weren't at yesterday's chapter meeting to get a sense of how expansive this organization has become over the past three years. I'd like to recognize each of our 18 chapters and I would ask that members of each chapter stand as I name your chapter. We're gonna lead off with uh, chapter 18, Alabama, and President Marcy Lewis. Do we have some Alabama representatives? Great. <clears throat> Our host chapter, Boston, and President Barbara Cronkey. I know there's a lot of Boston women here. <laughs> Chicago, and President Kathleen Belden. Florida and President Marianne Edmonds. <laughs> Georgia and President Leslie Powell. Do we have any Georgia? <laughs> Indiana, President R Rose Stark. Any Indiana? <laughs> Uh, Kansas and Missouri, Kelsey Spurgeon. <laughs> My home chapter, Los Angeles, and President Natalie Brill. <laughs> Louisiana and President Stephanie Ferry. <laughs> Minnesota and President Kathy Cardell. Uh, and our largest uh, chapter in terms of geography, the mountain region, President Erica Combs. <laughs> Northern California, Nadia Cisse. <laughs> Ohio and Katie Johnson, President. Pacific Northwest, Christine Reynolds. San Diego, Angela Colton. Tennessee, President Carol Ward. 
Texas, Lynette Branton, President. And finally, Virginia, President Stephanie Jones. Finally, I would like to recognize the tremendous efforts of the core Boston Conference planning team led by Megan, e Megan Burke and Susan Kendall. These women have dedicated so much time and effort, yes, and have really gone above and beyond. I, just in the last, I think, two or three weeks, they were having two conference calls a day, just amazing to make sure every detail and every part of today's program went perfectly. Uh, please stand so we can show you our appreciation, and, and this will be it, I promise. <laughs> Megan Burke, Susan Kendall, Lori Hindle, Julie Balerna, Jen M M Mendoza, and Puna Patadar. <laughs> Thank you. On behalf of the National Board and all the members in, in attendance, we really thank you. And with that, I'd like to invite you to begin lunch. Uh, there's a buffet right outside uh, in, in the lobby. Thank you.